Okay. I, can you hear me okay and see the screen? Yeah. We're good. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so a little bit of background um, myself first, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the document. Um, I've been working with V6 since 2002, I think. Um, I started at the UNH IOL. We've been testing IPv6 back when I thought it was only ever going to be in a lab to testing it deployments in lots of different places. So I worked at the IOL for 20 years, and now I'm the CTO at um, QA Cafe, and we test, we build test and analysis tools. Um, in particular, we test IoT and home gateways. So that's kind of how I got here to um, doing all this V6 work. I'm also the IPv6 ready uh, logo technical chair, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later in the presentation. So talk about the document that everyone wants to hear about is write 554 biz. So I'm going to give a little bit of history into what happened or how we got here, and then talk about what the latest changes are, um, are to it. So the authors of this document have changed a little bit over time. The original document, um, Jan and Sander wrote together, and then we, uh, Mara Kay joined uh, for the third iteration. In this fourth iteration, the two Tims, Tim and I, um, both joined for this revision of the document. So what is Right 554? Um, it's guidance on procuring IPv6 capable equipment, um, you know, in general. Uh, and it's a document that comes out of the Right IPv6 working group. Um, it's used by a lot of people for when they go to buy equipment, making sure they're asking the right questions, understanding what V6 things they should be looking for um, in their documents. So um, this is all, you know, it's just a way for people to have a common language to discuss. Uh, when buying these equipment, making sure that you're talking the same languages. Um, how it started, the original right document started because uh, the Slovenian government asked what they should be putting in their documents. It kind of makes sense. They uh, were working with um, Jan at the Go6 Institute, and they said, hey, this V6 thing sounds really important. We don't even know what to ask for. How can we go about doing that? So <clears throat> Jan took that idea and made it into a uh, right 501 basically is what they did. So um, the thing about this is it was adopted in, I think 2011 is the deal here. Um, but the thing that's marked here is, you know, there might be new versions in the future, which is how we get to where we're about to go. So that one came out in, sorry, 2010, that one came out. And then in 2011, we started working on updating the document um, to 554, which is the current version. Um, it got lots of review. Many of you on this call actually um, are listed in this review list. So it, it got lots of review the second go around from 501 to 554. Um, and a lot of people took a look at it, reviewed it, and made comments on it. So in June of 2012, that document came out. So the current revision was, you know, from 2012. The main contents is, you know, this is basically breaking products into different categories. So um, there's requirements for host, layer two switches, what I would call enterprise or smart switches, routers, um, network security equipment, CPEs, mobile devices, load balancers. And then there's a nice, um, there's a good section about uh, IPv6 support in the software. So um, multiple times since, you know, over the that nine year period was discussing how to update this document. Um, the good news is, and I think this is a good sign for V6, is we didn't need to tear up the whole document. And in this case, a lot of the stuff was still stable. There wasn't a ton of changes needed. So it's just a matter of picking when to make those changes. Um, <laughs> You know, as, as Jan and uh, Sanders say, it took them a little bit to get the courage to do this one more time after all the reviews last time. But when we got into it, you know, when we do this update, do we want to, you know, how do, do we want to expand the document? What do we want to include? How many details do we want to go into? Um, in the end, what happened was we decided to just update what we had. So we didn't add a whole lot of categories. We made a couple of changes we think that reflect um, the current IPv6 deployment. The basic changes, the first one is the classic, you know, every time you update an app, they have the fixed typos. We, we, there were some errors, some clarifications we made. Um, one of the biggest updates, and this was kind of important, is we needed to update the RFC references. So the old document, you know, IPv6 went to an internet standard, went to RFC 8200. And so that was one of the things we had to take all of the RFC names, updates, and make all of those changes to it. Um, there was a couple of oddly missing fundamental RFCs, like IPv6 over Ethernet wasn't in the original one, so we added that one. 
Um, some other things we removed um, send mostly because it's not a widely deployed technology. Um, we removed the bound v6 network that did exist. It was basically came from the moon v6 network to the bound v6 network. Good news is, and I think Jim would have admitted this is, you know, we didn't need it anymore. It's, there's enough v6 wide deployments that um, we didn't need that. So, and then I'm going to highlight some of the individual changes um, if people have interest. So, for host, we added some additional requirements, handling of overlapping fragments, atomic fragments. This is a lot of Fernando's work who just presented. Um, all of those are included in the document. Um, stable opaque addresses for Slack and DHCP, we added that requirement. Um, uh, another change, you know, DNS and RA, RAs, um, we had to add that as a mandatory requirement to kind of give most devices need DNS. Um, and because of Android, DHCP wasn't or isn't an option on every network. So RA, DNS and RA is. Um, one thing we changed was mobile v6. This has kind of been, you know, moving it to a more optional while it still exists. It's not widely used. So we, we, we downgraded that a little bit. Um, enterprise switches. Um, the main changes here, we added the additional security stuff. RA guard and DHCP guard are um, big ones. Those are to prevent, you know, rogue RA and rogue DHCP servers from ruining your network. You know, someone accidentally plugs in a router or a switch and then it says, hey, send me all your traffic or gives out addresses. It's not good for your network. So this is a nice security feature. Um, it's not widely deployed as one would hope. So this is one that we want to highlight to people to say, hey, if you're buying enterprise switches and routers, you want to make sure that they have those basic functionalities. Um, router changes, you know, we added the Donosorm 64. This has actually been more of a problem than I thought. We put this in recently and have discovered several routers that don't support this, much to my dismay. So I think this ended up being actually more important than I thought. I thought this was just a checkbox exercise, but then we found lots of routers that didn't do that. So that's a good change. Um, also, additionally, DNS and RA options that was not deployed widely in routers. So those are two additional. Um, we added some DHCP v6 relay options that are important to operators for tracking purposes. So those are included in there too. Um, CPEs, you know, I think we talked about this during Richard's talk. Um, 6092 was added as a requirement. It basically is a simple firewall that firewalls by default on CPE should support something. Um, we also added the whole slew of transition mechanisms. Um, you know, basically following the IETF v6 ops just put out a guide about this, about um, all the transition mechanisms and how they work. So we added that as well as, um, hey, you should look at those if you're an operator or enterprise and you need to support something like MAPT, like Matt Richard mentioned in the Sky Network. Um, mobile devices, we took this whole section out. Um, you know, the, the real thing here is the the 3G standards have much more to say about this now than what they did in 2012. And they have their own standards about V6 and you should go follow them. Um, you know, we, we removed this really because the, we let the 5G guys do that and Wi-Fi interfaces on hosts basically act as hosts. So we, we didn't need to say anything extra um, about those. Load balancers, we updated the standard forwarding as part of the update. Um, software, this is way more, a little bit, you know, this is probably the most expansive, some changes we made. Um, minimum requirements such as UI stuff, making sure that your device can support putting in V6 addresses. Um, you know, another big one is obviously DNS resolvers, either working over V6 transports and also checking for quad A's, which is the IPv6 version of this. Um, connections must support IPv6. You know, we found over time when we put applications and software in v6 only environments it goes quite poorly because there's some database connection some socket somewhere that needs a v4 connection outside of the box and that doesn't go very well um using happy eyeball tools default address selection those types of things make sure you check those see what happens um you know, the other thing we wanted to point out is sometimes people take this as this is the only things you need to do and it's 100% not. There's a lot of things with software you have to go check and look at um, and you should, you know, make sure that you think about all of the different areas. Um, in particular, you know, when it comes to cloud services is a big one here that you want to make sure that if you're connecting to a cloud service that it supports v6 and you can connect over it I and mean, see the previous presentation about cloud support and how things work um, in certain areas it doesn't work very well so it's something people should check look at 
um, what's going on now with this document. So we made all those changes. Um, it's going to be going out very, very shortly. I saw an update just not too long ago that we're very close to printing the new version of it. Um, you know, use this document as it's described. If you're purchasing equipment, you should go read the document and see, hey, these are the latest recommendations coming from um, the right community. Um, ask about V6 only support. Um, I think Doug is presenting later on the US government test program and has a lot to say about V6 only. So I'm not gonna steal his thunder when he talks about that. Um, but I think if you're building an enterprise, you might wanna start asking these questions because uh, it's gonna impact how you you know, how customers tell you they can deploy it. Um, and then the last thing I wanna mention here is the IPv6 ready logo list. So um, the IPv6 ready logo has been a program that's existed since 2003. There are 2,186 devices as of last night on the IPv6 ready core list. Um, basically that says, you know, follows all the IPv6 standards. This is really so that people don't have to individually test IPv6. Um, the program was created in 2003 to, you know, there was a lab in the UNH IOL was doing V6 testing and there was a lab in Japan called Tahi. They were doing testing and we decided to combine and kind of let's do one set of test results that everybody can use. And that's how the program was born. Um, it goes through and tests all the must and shoulds you know, the main three logos that we give out are the host logo, the router logo, and the CPE logo, which is focused on home gateways. They're slightly different. Um, we have tests for all of those. Those included uh, test all the must and shoulds. You can go look up a device and see if it's listed there. What version of software is listed there is also on there that it's supported. Um, additionally, there's, you know, ones for IPsec and DHCP, not widely as deployed or tested um, as one would like, but they're there if people want them. Um, Additionally, you know, one of the changes the Ready logo made last year, maybe the year before, probably two years ago now, um, we require that the testing be done in an IPv6 only environment. And this is again, to kind of push v6 deployments and not having any dependency. We don't want devices to have to connect to a v4 thing um, to work in a v6 only environment. So we made that change recently. Um, right 554, how does this, how does the Ready logo relate to that? We went through and every RFC or every uh, functional area that we talk about in there, we put an asterisk next to it to say, hey, the Ready logo covers this. So it's an easy way for people who want to make sure uh, they support, you know, that they're procuring something from the buying side. Hey, I'm buying something. I want to make sure it covers all these RFCs. I know the customer says it does. The Ready logo is kind of the proof. You can see that they've listed publicly marketed that they do these RFCs and they were tested and they submitted results. It does, the Ready logo also, I didn't mention this here, it covers conformance and interop. So it's it allows you to test against the tool. And then we actually, it does, you know, several implementations that are not yours. So um, to test against for routers and hosts in particular. On the CPE side, it's um, a CMPS, a DOCSIS device and a host on the LAN side that it'll test against to make sure all of that works. Questions? I don't, Tim, did I miss anything? Is there anything else you wanted to mention? No. Yeah, well, you showed me the slides in advance, so the, there was no surprises. It, it's all okay. <laughs> well covered. Thank you, Tim. Do we have questions? There's one from Craig about DNS search lists rather than our DNSS, I think. Um, just want to have a look um, That's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, they are both in there. This is from memory, but I believe I almost always, when we include them, we include both of them, we find. Um, not every, you don't need both, but we find that most of the time we require both of them. 